Aloha, and welcome to the Hawaii Transportation and Infrastructure Roundtable. My name is Congressman Kaya'i Kahele. I am here in Hilo, Hawaii, and I represent Hawaii's second congressional district in the United States House of Representatives. I'm also honored to serve on the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and I am so excited this morning and honored to have the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee Chairman Peter DeFazio to discuss the Build Back Better plan and the House Democratic priorities in the upcoming transportation and infrastructure package. In addition, for today's roundtable, we have three of Hawaii's most outstanding leaders who will discuss the importance and how critical it is that we invest and improve our infrastructure here in Hawaii. Now, Hawaii's report card for infrastructure as um, analyzed throughout the country rates Hawaii's infrastructure, excuse me, as a D plus. And that is due to lack of federal funding over the previous administration. And it has been difficult to maintain and improve our existing infrastructure systems. This is why we need to build back better. And this plan that the House Democrats will be proposing in the next uh, few weeks, we need that now. And so at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Chair DeFazio to speak on how we can build back better for Hawaii and our country. And I yield to the Chair and Mahalo for joining us today. Uh, thanks, Kai. Uh, Kai is a, a fabulous uh, addition uh, to the committee, obviously brings a tremendous expertise uh, in the area of aviation. Uh, and that's always a, you know, a, a work in progress. Uh, with the committee, uh, and he, he will be uh, invaluable there. But he's also the first member of the committee uh, since Maisie, uh, who uh, served with me on the committee uh, a number of years ago. Uh, and it's great to have Hawaii again uh, represented uh, on the committee. You have some very unique problems, unique needs as an island state. Uh, and uh, we need to be more attentive to those. As Kai said, the federal government has not been a good partner. Uh, for quite some time now, uh, you know, it's, the whole country as a whole is rated C, you know, slightly above you guys, C minus. Um, but that's only because of local effort, uh, not not the federal government contributing. So we intend to change that. Uh, this will be a transformative uh, transportation bill. Uh, it's not going to be Eisenhower 8.0. Uh, this is going to look at 21st century challenges. Uh, and, uh, and needs. Uh, obviously, one of the top challenges is dealing with climate change. Fossil fuels uh, from transportation are the largest contributor uh, for, for the United States to, uh, to fossil fuel pollution. Uh, you know, that there's, uh, we're gonna deal with that. Uh, we're gonna build back resilient uh, you know, to what are known and pending threats uh, with climate change severe weather events. You've had some tremendous rainstorms recently, I noted, uh, and uh, also for sea level rise and, and other things. And we want to build back in a way that uh, we use materials that are going to last longer, are potentially more climate friendly uh, in their production. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, uh, you know, we're going to be looking at creating a lot of jobs uh, everywhere, uh, including in Hawaii. Uh, with uh, with this with these investments, uh, the president uh, sketched it out uh, yesterday uh, pretty well. Uh, total package uh, around uh, two trillion, uh, six hundred thirty billion for transportation infrastructure. Uh, they are looking at about a hundred and forty percent increase in in transit funding. Uh, so that's not only to bring existing transit up to a state of good repair, but to give people more transit options. Uh, they're uh, looking at uh, bridges uh, throughout the system that need repair or replacement. Uh, they, I think they specified 10,000, but actually get more than that that need, that need work. Uh, electrification. Uh, now, uh, in, in Hawaii, uh, you, know, you have a lot of potential for renewable energy. There's going to be, coming from the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, lots of uh, investment in renewable energy because as we electrify transportation, you don't gain a heck of a lot uh, if you're charging off a fossil fuel plant, uh, but you do when we get to renewable uh, power. 
uh, grid reinforcement, uh, renewable generation. Uh, wastewater uh, is also a, a key uh, part from our committee. Uh, we're way behind on wastewater investment. Many communities uh, don't have adequate systems. Some never had adequate systems. Others are aged out. Uh, and uh, we're going to try and address that need. And there are a lot of jobs um, when you deal with uh, building uh, wastewater systems and drinking water, uh, which will be dealt with out of uh, the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee. So an overhaul uh, you know, comprehensive proposal. Uh, every uh, individual member uh, will get uh, an allocation for member directed spending of 15 to 20 million. Um, these, uh, these projects uh, will be, uh, you know, I, I reformed this process actually many years ago when I was subcommittee chair, Obama was president uh, and uh, unfortunately killed the uh, transportation bill back then. Uh, and we've never caught up since. Uh, and uh, this is our opportunity finally with a president who has the vision, uh, who's committed uh, and uh, is putting uh, you know, an, an amount of resources into it that will actually uh, get the job done, make America more competitive in the world economy and, and help all of us in our daily lives to get out of congestion uh, and, uh, you know, and to uh, move goods and people more efficiently. So uh, that's a really brief, very broad overview, but I'd like to leave some time for questions, if that's what you want to do, Kai. Yes, sir, Chair. And, and you talked about those unique needs and you talked about uh, energy and, and wastewater. And um, uh, these three individuals, I've asked them to, to just speak very quickly on some of those important things. And so I'm going to jump to our first speaker, uh, Kyle Chalk, who serves as the Assistant Executive Secretary Treasurer for the Hawaii Regional, Regional Council of Carpenters, the largest construction union in the state of Hawaii. And as you well know, Chair, President made his big announcement yesterday in Pittsburgh at a Carpenters and one of the big apprenticeship programs they had there. So Kyle Chalk, uh, I will yield to you. The floor is yours. Aloha Chair DeFazio, Congressman Kahele. It's an honor to be here with, with you all. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly speak about Hawaii's infrastructure needs. Uh, I'm Kyle Chalk with the Hawaii Regional Council of Carpenters. Uh, we're the largest construction union state union in the state of Hawaii. On President Biden's historic announcement yesterday, as you mentioned, uh, Representative Kahele did occur at our Carpenters Training Facility in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and it's a bold investment in the future of our country and in our state. Uh, we're pleased that the Congress and the Biden-Harris administration plans to move forward with an infrastructure package to help the state of Hawaii invest in projects, large and small, helping to modernize our highways, airports, and roads, as well as spur investments into much needed affordable housing projects, putting our people to work. As you may know, prior to COVID, Hawaii enjoyed the lowest unemployment rate in the country. And today, unfortunately, we have the highest unemployment rate in the nation. Perhaps our largest uh, construction project that we have currently ongoing and have ever undertaken as a state is our Honolulu Rail Transit Project. Mm -hmm. The project promises to be tra a transformative opportunity for Honolulu to redevelop its urban core uh, through transit-oriented development with the focus on affordable housing providing public transportation equity and options for our workforce and relief from the longest traffic commute times in the country as measured by time spent in traffic. Gives us an alternative to driving our cars and reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the process. And while much work on the project has been completed, the project is at a critical point and crossroads and the system deserves its necessary funding and federal support to be carried out to completion. Affordable housing has long been a major goal of our union for decades, and union members like ours form the backbone of the middle class. Yet for far too many of them, our members are unable to purchase the homes they're currently building. Hawaii has the lowest rate of home ownership in the country, and this bill will help to greatly reverse that trend. The Biden plan will invest $100 billion into affordable housing infrastructure that's more important than ever now. Uh, and it serves to attack some of the biggest impediments to building new affordable housing in Hawaii, namely the cost of roads, sewer, and water. And this is particularly challenging on the neighbor islands. The plan would also expand LIHTC projects that our members are currently working on and building by creating a new neighborhood investment tax credit, which will encourage rehabilitation of vacant homes in distressed areas with owner-occupant requirements that directly help many, many Hawaii families. Beyond housing, the bill promises to 
make investments in healthcare, particularly in rural healthcare, up to $10 billion in construction and modernization for our hospitals, and another $10 billion for community healthcare capital project grants. We're very excited about that. In addition to housing and in addition to healthcare, uh, you mentioned renewable energy, and we are blessed to have incredible resources for wind, solar, and geothermal, both at utility scale and in placing renewable energy facilities atop existing rooftops in schools and hospitals. And we've been directly working with our great partners at Hawaiian Electric Company to try to achieve our shared vision for the future. In closing, we've always believed that taxpayer investments must never leave workers behind. And we're extremely pleased to see HR2 directly address Davis-Bacon requirements. The proposal also specifically calls out the importance of project labor agreements for numerous clean energy projects, which is a great start. Private developers using federal tax credits and incentives will benefit, should also provide similar workforce protections and that don't get watered down as this bill moves forward. So let's use this infrastructure proposal to make sure Hawaii's workers, consumers, and businesses can all share and meaningfully, meaningfully benefit uh, in the result. Thank you, aloha and mahalo. Mahalo, Kyle. We will next hear from Scott Sue. Scott is the current president and he's a chief executive officer of Hawaiian Electric since 2020, and he leads Hawaii's largest utility across three islands. Mahalo, Scott. The floor is yours. Aloha, Chair DeFazio, Congressman Kahele. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me a few moments to um, share some comments about the, the importance of federal support for the energy sector here in Hawaii. So at Hawaiian Electric, we serve 95% of the population of, of our state. We keep electric power flowing for homes, businesses, hotels, schools, and critically important facilities like hospitals, airports, and of course, our military bases. So there may be some debate nationally about clean energy, but I can tell you that here in Hawaii, there really is none. We're 2,500 miles away from the nearest mutual aid. And so for purposes of self-reliance and energy security, we really have to modernize our electric system to be more sustainable, cleaner, and stronger to withstand the natural and man-made threats that come our way. So decarbonization and resilience are really must-dos for us at Hawaiian Electric. So in Hawaii, this translates to building a diverse portfolio of resources um, filled by natural resources like biomass, the wind, the sun, and the heat within the earth. We've made dramatic progress in Hawaii over the last few years. On some days, we're using renewable energy resources to meet close to 90% of our daytime electricity demand. We've reduced use of imported oil for power generation by 100 million gallons a year. And by the end of next year, coal will no longer be used to make electricity here in Hawaii. We're modernizing our power grid to allow for two-way power flows, distributed energy resources, and resilient microgrids. We're in the process of deploying batteries sensing devices that will allow us to operate our system more efficiently and reliably and provide our customers with new services. And we're planning for a more expansive public EV charging network so that we'll be ready for what will be explosive growth and demand for EVs in the near future, especially as more EVs come to market. With this transformation come the challenges of cybersecurity and physical security of the power grid and especially here in a state with so much critical defense infrastructure, including serving as the headquarters of Indo-Pacific Command, this is critically important. Now to date, this cost has been mainly borne by our customers and we see a role for the government in funding and facilitating this critical work, considering the role that Hawaii plays in the defense of the nation. In short, we're in the midst of a critical modernization of our electric system one that's driven by very real-time needs for energy security, resilience, and sustainability. The federal government's support of this modernization is badly needed as Hawaii is a small state with limited resources and our utility customers really can't bear the full burden of all of these improvements. I wanna re-emphasize the uniqueness and isolation of Hawaii. Federal mandates and standards often don't fit the reality of running six separate island grids we're not connected to the bulk mainland grid and we don't have nuclear or natural gas. We can't call neighboring states if we run short on power. We're on our own. So we hope any plans will take into account the leadership Hawaii has already shown in transitioning to a clean energy economy and will recognize our needs and that one size doesn't fit all. 
So in closing, I believe this federal investment presents an enormous opportunity to speed our transition to build a more secure and sustainable energy future for the nation, as well as for the people of Hawaii. So mahalo for allowing me to share these comments. Aloha. Mahalo, Scott. Finally, Chair, we're going to hear from Dr. Greg Asner from the Hawaii Marine Education and Resource Center to discuss how infrastructure investment is desperately needed for Hawaii's environment, especially its aging wastewater system. Dr. Asner. Thank you, Chair DeFazio, Representative Kaheli. I appreciate being here. And uh, I have a few slides to show because I'm a scientist and that's how we communicate. Uh, the first thing I want to say is uh, if it's not obvious, water connects everything and everyone in the state of Hawaii. And almost nowhere is that more true than in an island state where these uh, connections are tight. They affect a variety of, of issues from human health to tourism and everything in between. Next. I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, we have three major issues with uh, current infrastructure across Hawaii. I'm not sure if the slide is coming across, but I can just mention them. One is impervious surfaces. The impervious surfaces that we see across Oahu, for example, uh, generate enormous amounts of runoff uh, and the, the way that that impervious surface has, has uh, been constructed over the years uh, puts it at risk, especially in a changing climate. Soil mobilization is the second one. Soils are being mobilized from uh, infrastructural issues, uh, for example, on the southern shores of Molokai. Uh, we see an enormous amount of sediment that's going into the ocean and onto coral reefs. And the third is, uh, is probably one of the biggest ones, and that's our on-site sewage disposal systems. Hawaii currently has 88,000 cesspools across the islands. I'm on the big island here. We have 30,000 of those cesspools. They're distributed around the state in a way that's extremely hard to mitigate, but it's essential. Um, NOAA has done a, an in, incredible uh, job mapping the, the fate of these um, sewer systems as they go out of homes and in, into the land and into the coral reef system. They've mapped it and it shows enormous, enormous amounts of um, sewage going into our coastal waters. So much so that the research that's been done also now con connects deeply this issue with a severe and rapid decline in our coral reefs, for example. Um, my program, we operate an aircraft program uh, that maps these islands and maps these reefs uh, every year now. And in this process, uh, we have revealed not only where he's flipping through these, I'm, I'm just doing it by memory here. Go ahead, next. Uh, that's, that's where our pollution is, the decrease and decline in coral reefs. Next. We map every year to, to look at the condition of our ecosystems. Here's a map on the right of where our coral reefs are and, and their condition. Red is good, blue is not so good. What's making this map? We've also analyzed that with our colleagues from state and federal agencies. Next. And these are the real culprits behind this. Nearshore development, water quality, ocean temperature and fishing issues. Now, three of these are regional issues, nearshore development, water quality, and fishing. Uh, ocean temperature is of course a global climate issue that we all have to work on, but these other three issues are regional to local and that's where we need a lot of help. Next. So my last uh, points here are that from an ecological perspective, the very environment that we all depend on, our infrastructural needs are rather clear when it comes to water. One is that we need to prioritize and accelerate the conversion of these cesspools to new capture systems. There is a, a, a law that's put, been put in place, I think it's called Act 125, to, to say that we'll do it by 2050. From an ecological point of view, that's too late for a lot of our downstream and shoreline ecosystems. So we need to accelerate. Next. We need to expand and improve our, improve our wastewater treatment facilities. We have too few, too far in between, and uh, they're just not able to serve uh, the functions that we need across the state. Next. We need to mitigate these impervious services I mentioned and reduce erosion. I can't tell you how big of, it, of the, an issue that both of these are. And finally, we need to mitigate chemical effluent mobilization. I didn't have time to talk about that, but the movement, the movement of water today is part and parcel to the movement of chemicals uh, from land to sea. Thank you very much for your time, Mahalo.
Thank you so much, Dr. Asner. Apologize for the technical difficulties, but um, I'm glad we got a few of those slides up at the end. Okay, Chair, we know you're a busy man and you have a few more minutes and you need to go. I have uh, a, question, a couple questions that have come in. A uh, question for the Chair is, uh, would there be funds to mitigate gap in broadband? And um, uh, do you have anything in regards to, to that? Uh, yeah, broadband is uh, a major focus. Uh, I think the bill we passed in the House last year was 86 billion, I believe. Uh, uh, President Biden's proposal is 96 billion for universal national broadband. Uh, you know, a bunch of the broadband companies started raising concerns uh, yesterday. But I mean, the problem in a deregulated environment is there's a whole lot of people that they don't have any incentive to extend service to. Uh, so I, I think we can we can work this through. I mean, we're not uh, going to be taking over their business, but uh, they aren't going to be. It's like rural electrification was, you know, a century or a little less than a century ago in the mainland. Uh, so uh, this is a major focus of the bill. Another question, Chair, is uh, you stated each member would receive 15 to 20 million or billion. I imagine it is. Billion. <laughs> I would love to have 20 million uh, billion for Hawaii, sir. It's million. I wish it was billion. Um, no, um, we're starting out uh, with a fairly modest allocation and we're, and we're doing it equitably among all members uh, to demonstrate that, uh, you know, local members know better than their, their state agencies. I mean, no offense to any state agency people are on or the federal government in Washington, D.C. about what some specific unfunded needs are that relate to infrastructure. Uh, in your districts and members also, of course, you don't have that many can pool their projects uh, to uh, to enhance the uh, purchasing power for uh, you know, projects. Okay. Um, last but not least, uh, do each of our any of our panelists, either Kyle, Scott, or Greg, have a question for the chair while we have an opportunity? Put you all on the spot. Not, not so much of a question, uh, Chair DeFazio, but I just want to express, uh, you know, appreciation again for the recognition of how important it is to invest in the critical infrastructure. I mean, I've been an infrastructure guy most of my life, and um, you know, this is just absolutely this is the time to 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 do this investment. Yeah, it's a potentially a unique uh, opportunity. It's been way too long delayed. I mean. Uh, we haven't reauthorized the SRF for wastewater since 88. Uh, and uh, it's only done in the appropriations process. It's a billion a year, which is pathetic. The unmet needs uh, calculated by American Society of Civil Engineers nationwide, including Hawaii and Alaska is 271 billion. Uh, I'm proposing 50 billion, 40 billion in the SRF for the low, no interest loan program, revolving loans so the state can put the money out again, uh, and 10 billion in direct grants for communities that are disadvantaged and won't be able to afford even a no interest uh, loan to, uh, to get systems or upgrade their systems. Kyle? Yes, Chair, what uh, do you see as the timeline for passage of the bill? And do you have any deal breakers that you would see as non-starters as we shepherd this through the House? Um, well, my original hope was to move the bill uh, the first week in May. Uh, you know, DOT, the Department of Transportation, wants to provide some uh, comments on the bill we had last Congress. They won't be ready till uh, mid-April, plus the member projects are a uh, burden for staff to uh, vet. So we're looking uh, probably uh, a little later in May than the first week, probably the third or fourth week in May. Uh, and, uh, you know, the last conversation I had with House leadership was we hope to move the whole package, which obviously, uh, you know, uh, the committee that Kai and I are on has the largest single portion um, but uh, we've got the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, for the things I already mentioned. We've got uh, the uh, Banking Committee for Housing. We've got Ed and Labor for Schools uh, and, uh, and some other uh, investments there. So um, we're hoping to, and the plan was to do it the way we did last year, move the full package through the House before the 4th of July recess. Dr. Asner? I do have a question, Chair DeFazio. What are the opportunities for connecting this infrastructure bill with the, the climate change and climate action uh, activities and bills that are that are proposed? 
Well, uh, it's a, you know, it's a major focus of my portion of the bill and the Energy and Commerce Committee's portion of the bill. Uh, and then of course, uh, some things uh, will relate to, I mean, if you're gonna be looking at carbon taxes or whatever, uh, that's always a means committee, a uh, separate committee. Uh, so, um, you know, we're, I'm working very closely with a, a lot of the uh, environmental groups uh, with the Blue Green Alliance, which, uh, you know, and since we've been well represented for the carpenters here, the carpenters are a critical part of the Blue Green Alliance. We need to convince uh, working people, uh, you know, who feel, you know, threatened uh, because, because of the change, of the change. Uh, uh, from, from fossil, fossil fuel, fuel to, uh, you know, to making them comfortable with the fact that actually uh, we're all going to do better and they're going to do just fine as we pull through this with the jobs we're going to create. And finally, for me, uh, Chair, uh, one of the questions came in was about uh, water infrastructure and uh, drinking water infrastructure. And the question was, is there funding for that in this bill? And um, my understanding is that the Build Back Better plan that we are proposing will eliminate all lead pipes and service lines in our drinking water systems. Uh, is, that, um, is that accurate? Uh, yes, that's been proposed to get rid of all of the lead pipes. There is no safe level uh, for lead in drinking water, not zero. Uh, so that's a, a key part. I don't know how much Hawaii is cursed with uh, lead pipes, but they're endemic uh, throughout the country. Uh, and, um, you know, the, the Congress is odd. Uh, Kai, you and I have wastewater. We're over here and drinking water is over in energy and commerce. Uh, but we work uh, really closely with energy and commerce. So uh, my understanding is their proposals on drinking water uh, will be similar to what I proposed on wastewater, plus a, uh, an additional allocation for lead pipe replacement. That's gonna be very expensive. I, I've seen, we're, we're still drilling down on some of the details of this, but I, I think I saw 70 billion uh, for lead pipe replacement and that's absent the other needs we have in drinking water that we have to take care of uh, to provide people and both uh, Chairman Pallone and I want to have, and we've tried a couple of times to do this, ongoing problems to help people uh, with their uh, water uh, bills and their, and their sewer bills uh, and as, a, as a permanent program like the uh, LIEP, you know, the Energy Assistance Program. And I'm hopeful that can be part of this package. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, I know you have to move on to your next engagement. So on behalf of the state of Hawaii, on behalf of Kyle Chalk, Scott Sue and Dr. Greg Asner, we want to sincerely mahalo you for taking 35 minutes of your day to join us. We really mean that. We are excited. I'm excited to work with you, Chair, on the Build Back Better plan. And so thank you all for tuning in today. Uh, for our panelists, for the Chair, we wish you uh, uh, aloha and mahalo nui loa and ahui ho. Thank you and have a great day.